Thank you for joining us at the Center for Security, Race and Rights for the first lecture in our 2022 to 2023 lecture series on race, security and empire. That is the theme uh, for this year. The Center for Security, Race and Rights is proud to be housed in the People's Electric Law School, also known as Rutgers Law School, which is physically located at Rutgers University, Newark under the bold leadership of Chancellor Nancy Cantor. There are few universities in this country that have the courage to follow through on their rhetorical commitments to social justice and academic freedom. And so today's lecture entitled Consistent Partiality, U.S. Foreign Policy on Palestine, Israel is part of that proud tradition. We do not shy away from talking, addressing, and critically examining controversial and timely issues. My name is Sahar Aziz. I'm Professor of Law and Chancellor Social Justice Scholar at Rutgers Law School. I'm also the Executive Director of the Center for Security, Race, and Rights. And it is my distinct pleasure to host Professor Peter Beinart and Human Rights Attorney Sarah Lee Whitson to discuss, critically, to discuss and critically examine the human and civil rights consequences of America's explicit and longstanding support or unconditional support for the state of Israel. Now, Peter Beinart is professor of journalism and political science at Newmark School of Journalism at the City University of New York. Shout out to CUNY, another law school that's very social justice oriented and also the entire university. Uh, professor Beinart is the author of the book, The Crisis of Zionism. He's also editor at large of Jewish Currents. He's an M MSNBC political commentator, a frequent contributor to the New York Times, and a non-resident fellow at the Foundation for Middle East Peace. He also writes the Beinart Bein Notebook newsletter on substack.com, so you should always check out his latest work. Our second uh, panelist and guest is Sarah Lee Whitson, who is Executive Director of Democracy for the Arab World Now, also called Dawn. Previously, she served as Executive Director of Human Rights Watch's Middle East and North Africa Division from 2004 to 2020, overseeing the work of the division in 19 countries with staff located in 10 countries. Ms. Whitson has led dozens of advocacy and investigative missions throughout the region, focusing on issues of armed conflict, accountability, legal reform, migrant workers, and human rights. She's published widely on human rights and foreign policy in the Middle East in international and regional media, including the New York Times, Foreign Affairs, the Washington Post, Foreign Policy, the Los Angeles Times, and CNN. So with that, a warm welcome to our uh, guests today. We're very uh, honored to have you. Uh, so if you all want to turn on your cameras, um, welcome Peter and welcome Sarah. It's truly, it's truly an honor to have you. I'm a big fan of both of your work. Uh, and so it's, we're fortunate to have your expertise. So I thought I would start the conversation and just for our audience, this is going to be more of a conversational uh, format as opposed to presentations by both uh, panelists. So I'd like to start the conversation by going to the heart of the issue, right, that tends to shut down any discussion on the human rights and humanity of Palestinians. And that is the allegation that any criticism of Israel is thinly veiled anti-Semitism. Um, indeed, this charge was boosted when the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, also called IHRA, uh, included in its definition of anti-Semitism, the example of calling Israel a racist state. So, and unfortunately the definition has been weaponized by many special interest groups who um, have a very specific political agenda, which is to quash any discussion or academic freedom on university campuses about, uh, about Palestine, in particular about the perspective of Palestinians and the human rights violations they're experiencing. And ultimately to blacklist university students that is frankly reminiscent of the McCarthyist era. So can you explain, can you both explain what is going on? Here? Is this merely ideological warfare or is there merit to this expansive definition of anti-Semitism? And more importantly for our topic today, how is it affecting US foreign policy on Palestine and Israel? So Peter, I, I wanted to start with you and then, and then we'll move to Sarah. Sure, no, and to be fair, I, I don't think most, um, most defenders of Israel or most people in um, who support the IHRA definition would say that any criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. What they would say 
is that opposing the existence of Israel as a Jewish state is anti-Semitic. Um, and the, um, the, I think to understand why this has become so important, one has to understand that the paradigm that we've been living in since the 1990s, which was the paradigm of the two-state solution, in which Israel would leave the territories that it conquered in 1967, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip, these places where it controls the lives of millions of Palestinians who live under Israeli control, but can't become citizens, can't vote for the Israeli government that controls their lives, live in West Bank under military law and in Gaza under blockade, right, which violates really basic notions of human rights. The idea is we're going to solve this problem by giving the Palestinians citizenship in their own state, and Israel will remain as a Jewish state. But what's happened since the 1990s, in large measure because Israel has subsidized all of this settlement growth in the West Bank, the notion of an independent, sovereign, viable Palestinian state has become more and more impossible to imagine, right? So if you think about it, if you believe that Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem deserve to be citizens of, the, of a country, right, the country in which they live, and you're not going to give them their own country, then naturally people who believe in things like human rights will say, well, they should be citizens of Israel or this territory that they already live in, right? But of course, if they're citizens, then, Israel, then in fact, Israel st would not be a Jewish state, certainly in the way it is now, right? It would not have, right now it's a Jewish state because most of the Palestinians under its can't control can't vote. If they can vote, then they would naturally change the definition of the state to be one that reflects their own identity. Maybe a, a, a state that treats everyone with equality under the law, irrespective of your race or religion or sex. And that, and it's precisely because the death of the two-state solution leads people who believe in human rights naturally towards that conclusion that the response has been from the Israeli government and allies around the world to say, no, 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 you can't take that position because taking the position that Israel should, that this territory should be a treat place which gives everyone citizenship and treats them equally under the law is bigotry, right? Just think about how Orwellian that is, right? To say you support equality under the law and citizenship for all is anti-Semitic. The posi what position is not bigoted? to support a status quo in which millions of people are denied the most basic rights because they have the misfortune of being Palestinian and not Jewish, right? So the whole thing really is in a crazy kind of double speak, but it is essentially, I think, a desire to impede the natural movement towards saying there is something wrong in the self-definition of a Jewish state if Jewish statehood means that you have millions of people who cannot be citizens and cannot vote in the country in which they live. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I guess I would add that the weaponization of the label anti-Semitic uh, has been used for many, many decades. Uh, probably uh, even before the IHRA definition uh, came to try to uh, legalize it in a sense, and, and I'll explain what I mean by that, um, to deflect from criticism of the state of Israel and the Israeli government uh, and its uh, systematic and widespread human rights abuses of Palestinians as well as war crimes uh, in the occupied Palestinian territories. Um, for as long as I've been working on Israel-Palestine, uh, the number one defense of people whose only interest is to defend uh, Israel and the Israeli government from criticism has been to attack uh, uh, the facts uh, by labeling the speakers as anti-Semitic, uh, to never address the facts of mass home demolitions, theft of land, uh, mass executions of civilians, uh, apartheid, uh, uh, by just saying, well, the speaker is anti-Semitic. So it's a, it's a tired tactic. What's dangerous about this now is that the IHRA definition is seeking a form of quasi-legal status um, because the advocates of that definition are seeking to have uh, state agencies, federal agencies, recognize that as a working definition, um, which means that uh, for someone who says that everybody living under Israel Israeli sovereignty should have equal rights, um, uh, that that is de facto anti-Semitic because in some people,
people's minds uh, that undermines the status of Israel as a Jewish state. I don't think it needs to, uh, and I wouldn't concede that it does. Um, but then therefore, those people should be sanctioned and punished, deprived of federal funding, deprived of state funding. Uh, and we already seeing versions of that um, when, for example, most recently, uh, Morningstar, uh, one of the biggest rating agencies uh, uh, and publications, uh, you know, rating companies, acquired a small company uh, that rates companies uh, according to a human rights metric. And because that human rights metric includes rating uh, Israel for its human rights abuses and therefore ranking it quite low, uh, Morningstar was attacked as anti Semitic. And I believe 13, if not 17, attorney generals of several states uh, threatened to terminate business with Morningstar. Uh, because merely ranking Israel for its human rights abuses and advising companies that their business in Israel would contribute to those abuses was deemed anti-Semitic. And so Morningstar had to uh, literally dump the company it had acquired and dump all human rights ratings by this company um, because any ranking or rating of Israel's human rights record was being labeled by state attorney generals uh, as uh, anti-Semitic. I think this is a very, very dangerous intrusion on uh, our free speech, on our free speech rights, on our, 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 our willingness and desire to associate with whomever we want, whenever we want, um, and, you know, is really just a, a long line in a series of uh, the Israeli governments and the Israeli government supporters' efforts to use law uh, as a weapon, as a tool to silence uh, those who want to criticize and believe Israel's human rights record is uh, deserving of, of criticism, uh, as of course, uh, uh, I believe. Thank you, Sarah. And, and I just wanna add, you know, one of the challenges when you're dealing with trying on the one hand to protect the rights and the dignity of minorities, but also ensure that you live in a society where we can have critical debate and we can disagree, obviously in a civil manner and respectfully, is that you have to be careful, and you alluded to this, Sarah, that if you use terminology that isn't accurate, then you actually decrease or erode the power, right, of those civil rights uh, efforts. So I'll give you an example. There was, it was a, a years back during kind of the peak of the global war on terror when things were, I think, at their worst in the US. There was a group of people within kind of the Muslim civil rights circles, which is the, you know, the circles that I was in before I became an academic, who wanted to define Islamophobia so broad that it was effectively going to include, include criticism of Saudi Arabia. Right? And because, it, and, and anything that criticized Saudi Arabian practices that somehow could be used. And there were certainly, I think, I was suspicious and many of us were suspicious that there was some lobbying going on behind the scenes by the Saudi regime. But I remember this internal debate within Muslim communities. And some people were like, yes, let's do this because this will take a hard approach and we'll make sure to make it you know, zero tolerance for anti-Muslim racism and Islamophobia. But others were saying, whoa, 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 whoa. We have to differentiate. And if we overuse it and inaccurately, people will no longer believe us when Islamophobia is really happening. So I guess this kind of leads me to, to ask um, Peter a, a question that is twofold. One is, what are the debates? Um, so when we're talking about Israel's human rights record, which has been in the news for quite a while, and, well, for the last year, I would say at least, in ways that's unusual in the United States anyway, um, by human, the report by Human Rights Watch, uh, UN officials have stated that um, Israel is an apartheid state, Human Rights Watch has concluded that, other human rights organizations. Um, and so before I ask Sarah kind of the legal ex explanation of whether there is actually, does this, is this an accurate conclusion based on the law and the facts? I'm interested, Peter, in you know, both your analysis on that, but also what are the conversations that are being had within the diverse Jewish communities within the United States um, with regard to kind of this label of the apartheid state or this broader, or broader you know, what the definition of anti-Semitism and how that can actually be counterproductive for protecting against anti-Semitism. Right, well, so 
American Jews are deeply divided on these questions. Um, so there's a, there was a poll that came out uh, a while back which suggested that about 25% of American Jews themselves endorse the idea that Israel is an apartheid state. Um, um, and, and what's remarkable about that, right, is essentially according to American Jewish, mo the most powerful American Jewish organizations, that position is an anti-Semitic position, right? So you're essentially saying that a very large number of American Jews and a particularly large number of younger American Jews Right, are the are anti-Semites or, or participating in anti-Semitism, which 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 is it's a biz, kind of a bizarre position to take, right? These are in many cases your own children and grandchildren, right? Um, and um, so I think that what we see is that actually out there in the country, the there's a there's a, a, a wide and I would say growing cleavage among American Jews along two axes. The first is generational. Um, because younger American Jews, like younger Americans in general, are more sympathetic towards Palestinian rights. They've grown up with seeing right-wing Israeli governments that have no interest in ending Israel's occupation and are often aligned with right-wing forces in the United States. Whereas older American Jews um, are more likely to have a, a um, to kind of see Israel as a as an imperiled and existentially threatened country. Um, you, the other the other division you have is is over religion, right? So just as among Amer white American Christians, you tend to find that those who are more religiously engaged are more politically conservative. You find that within the among American Jews as well. Um, so you have a very clear kind of divide along these two axes. But what's important to understand is that is that certain groups of American Jews are much better represented in American Jewish organizational leadership than others, right? This is not unique to Jews, right? We know that many Cuban Americans, for instance, don't think that a blockade on Cuba is a good idea, but they tend to not be the, the people who lead Cuban American organizations. So if you look at the American Jewish organizations that have the most influence in Washington, they tend to represent older, wealthier, and more religious American Jews, who tend to take the position that their role should be to defend Israel against virtually all criticism and to ensure that American support is maintained unconditionally. And one of the consequences of this is a really deep and often profound alienation that you find among younger American Jews towards their own leadership and the institutions through which they grew up, whether it's their synagogues or their camps or their schools. And one of the things that worries me among my obviously deep concern about the impact of all of this for Palestinians is the impact of, of this on the future of American Jewish life. I'm someone who for, cares a great deal about having a strong, vibrant, committed, educated Jewish community. And one of the things I see is that some kids are actually alienated from that. They won't even go to the Hillel on their own campus, which could be a resource for them to actually have a deepening understanding and appreciation and knowledge of Judaism because they're so morally alienated because they see those institutions as having sold out at their ethical principles on the question of Israel. And that worries me for our own community. That's really, that's really powerful. It's really informative. We, we have our own, it's interesting, we have different fault lines within Muslim American younger generations and their relationship with mosques and with religious organizations. But that's, but I, I appreciate you helping to de-essentialize, right, Jew, the, the diverse Jewish American communities. I think that's also part of the conversation that tends not to happen enough. Um, so Sarah, let's let's kind of take advantage of your of your extensive and deep legal expertise as a human rights advocate. As we know, there it's very contentious this conclusion that Human Rights Watch has made and some other organizations that Israel is an apartheid state. What what is you know, what is the factual basis that supports it? Um, and I mean, I think a lot of us are familiar with the politics, but but what's what is it that caused H Human Rights Watch and some of these other orgs? to hit the tipping point to say, that's it, it's gone apartheid. Because as we know, those of us who kind of keep track of what's been going on in the West Bank and Gaza, a lot of these practices aren't new. Uh, yeah, uh, you're right, Sahad, these practices are not new and Human Rights Watches, Amnesty International's, Harvard Law Schools, uh, the, the UN Special Rapporteur for Israel and the Occupied Palestinian Territory, uh, their legal reports may be new, but the situation of apartheid, the crimes of apartheid and persecution uh, uh, by Israel are not new. Um, but I think you're right uh, that there has reached a tipping point, um, which led all 
all of these organizations and institutions uh, to finally prepare a legal analysis that looked at the decades of military occupation, the decades uh, of laws uh, inside Israel that privilege uh, Jewish uh, citizens of Israel over uh, non-Jewish citizens of Israel, particularly uh, Muslim Palestinians, uh, to draw on those uh, uh, that systematic pattern of many decades to reach a conclusion that this is indeed apartheid. I think there's a larger story to be told uh, as to why these reports have been have issued uh, in the past year, uh, year and a half. Um, um, but I think given that we do have a legal audience here uh, and uh, that I know some people are uh, seeking legal uh, credit, um, I thought I would just spend a few minutes to explain the law uh, of apartheid and persecution and how these organizations uh, came to conclude that Israel uh, is committing the crimes of of apartheid and persecution, which are two distinct crimes. Uh, and in so doing, I am gonna try to mush their reports together since the reports weren't identical. Uh, but in the broadest uh, brush, I would say, um, first of all, uh, in terms of uh, the crime of apartheid, uh, it is a part of international criminal law, um, which includes not just the 1973 International Convention on the Suppression and Punishment of the Crime of Apartheid, uh, but also the 1998 Rome Statute to the International Criminal Court, um, which both define apartheid as a crime against humanity, uh, consisting of three elements. And, and it's important to note that these are broadly uh, 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 drafted elements that are not particular to any one geography or territory, even though the crime of apartheid has been associated with South Africa. Uh, uh, the laws do not apply only to South Africa or the South African situation. Instead, they look at certain facts, certain elements. Those elements include, uh, most importantly, an intent by one racial group to dominate another, uh, second, systematic oppression by the dominant group over the marginalized group. And finally, uh, particularly grave abuses uh, known as uh, inhumane acts. So what the uh, uh, legal analysis of these various organizations, as well as Beth Salem, and is the leading Israeli human rights organization, and Al-Haq, a leading Palestinian organization, uh, to name really just to, to emphasize that these are uh, conclusions by local organizations, their conclusions by international human rights organizations, their conclusions by uh, the leading uh, law school, uh, 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 Harvard Law School, uh, that has investigated this issue, and the conclusion of the United Nations through the UN Special Rapporteur's report. Um, and what they found is that it is Israeli policy to maintain the domination <clears throat> by Jewish Israelis over Palestinians across Israel and the occupied territory. Uh, it is coupled, uh, Human Rights Watch specifically found, in the occupied territory with systematic oppression and humane acts. Um, Amnesty's report is broader because it went back to look at Israel's record since the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948 uh, to find also systematic oppression and inhumane acts uh, against Palestinians within uh, 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 Israel proper, within the state that was established and declared uh, in 1948. Uh, the facts are that in the, Palestine, in the Palestinian territories, Israeli authorities methodologically, systematically privilege one of the groups, Jewish Israelis, who are governed under uh, the same body of laws with the same rights and privileges, whether they live in occupied Palestinian territory or whether they live in Israel proper. They get one set of laws. Uh, 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 a civil law, a civil law that uh, is actually quite uh, protective of, of civil and uh, uh, political rights uh, of Israeli Jews, as well as uh, quite protective of rights of Israelis charged with crimes. This is in contrast to um, the rights that are allocated to Palestinians, which are inferior, um, which are harsh, which are cruel, which are military laws uh, uh, against Palestinians, so they systematically discriminate against them wherever they live. Uh, effectively, you have two sets of laws, a good set of laws, a friendly set of laws, a protective set of laws for Israeli Jews and a harmful set of laws, a discriminatory set of laws, a cruel set of laws, for example, that allow children uh, to be uh, uh, detained uh, uh, preemptively, indefinitely, without charge, uh, 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 something that would never happen uh, to an Israeli Jewish child. 
Um, the intent to dominate, uh, uh, how is this reflected uh, across Israel and the occupied territory? Um, the intent to privilege Jewish Israelis at the expense of Palestinians is done uh, 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 through ways that they openly describe uh, as Palestinians being a demographic threat. And so passing laws that make the land available uh, uh, for Jewish communities while concentrating Palestinians in dense enclaves to segregate them from Jewish Israelis, uh, to not allow them to grow and expand their communities, to deny them building permits, to confiscate their homes whenever possible and demolish them. Um, it also includes efforts, for example, to Judaize uh, the Negev and Galilee regions of Israel uh, in order for the declared public intent of maintaining a solid Jewish majority. Um, maintaining a solid Jewish majority uh, doesn't just come with the carrots of inviting Jews from around the world to move to Israel and receive all kinds of economic benefits uh, uh, when they uh, uh, acquire Israeli citizenship but to punish and deprive uh, Palestinians and Arabs in that area uh, in order to persuade them to move. And that is what we've seen. We've seen mass forced displacement of Palestinians uh, to push them out uh, while they settle Jews in the land uh, and, and encourage them and give them benefits uh, uh, to live there. Um, the heart of the system is keeping Palestinians separated from each other as well into these distinct territorial uh, legal uh, domains. There are statements and actions by Israeli authorities that have clarified this intent to maintain domination, including the passage of the nation state law, which explicitly states that Israel is a nation state of the Jewish people and only the Jewish people, uh, never mind the 20% uh, uh, non uh, uh, Jewish people, the Palestinian, Arabs, and Christians who live there as well as the growing body of laws that I mentioned privilege Israeli settlers uh, in the occupied territory, uh, but do not apply to Palestinians. Um, we see the institutional discrimination that Palestinians, uh, uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel face, uh, including that allow hundreds of Jewish towns to exclude them, uh, and budgets that allocate very small resources to Palestinian schools, for example, as opposed to uh, Jewish uh, uh, Israeli children. And we see the systematic oppression and inhumane acts, uh, including the sweeping restrictions on movement, uh, the 14-year the closure of Gaza, uh, the confiscation of more than a third of the land of the West Bank, and denial of residency rights of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians. Um, the system of laws that keeps Palestinians uh, forced to live in certain enclaves, not allowed to move, living under uh, a military rule, uh, and as I mentioned, the mass home demolitions, uh, uh, at, as well as the forcing of thousands of Palestinians out of their homes. Um, the, uh, this, it's hard to summarize in just a few minutes, uh, the 200 page report that, uh, that Amnesty uh, International produced, the 200 plus page report that Human Rights Watch produced that uh, you know, provides very deep, deep factual and legal analysis. Mm -hmm. um, but anyone who has carried out an actual factual legal investigation uh, of uh, the circumstances of Israeli policies have all reached the same conclusion. Israel is committing the crimes of apartheid and persecution uh, against Palestinians uh, living under their control. Can I just add to the- Oh, go ahead, yes. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to make the point that these are not legal analysts, but it's worth noting again, specifically because the, the claim that, the, that these conclusions are anti-Semitic, that these are conclusions not only of, of B'Tselem and Yesh Din, which are two of Israel's probably most prominent human rights organizations, but quite a number of quite prominent Israeli politicians themselves, from former Prime Minister Ehud Barak to former Prime Minister Ehud Olmer, have said that Israel was on its way to apartheid if, the Pal if there could be no Palestinian state. Ami Ayalon, the former head of Shin Bet, Aleph Bat Yehushua, who recently passed away, who was one of Israel's most prominent novelists. So um, there, are, there are many, many people who it seems to me could, uh, could who it would be absurd to suggest are anti-Semitic, um, who have also come to this conclusion because it's in Bishop T Desmond Tutu, Cyril Ramaphosa, the head of the South African president, because when you actually look at the legal condition for Palestinians, it's actually difficult not to come to the conclusion that you have one group legally dominating and oppressing another. So this is actually a good segue into a follow-up question I had for you, Peter, is 
you know, we had had, I, I've read some of your work that can carefully um, and thoughtfully distinguishes between, uh, or, or between political Zionism and cultural Zionism. And admittedly, I, I saw that and I thought, hmm, that looks a little suspect. I don't understand. You know, could, could you unpack that? And then how does this analysis that Sarah just gave and that you, you also supplemented, what does that mean for Zionism? Right? What does that mean? It has, have the right wing Jews in Israel made a two state solution impossible and made a one state solution inevitable or in the alternative apartheid indefinite? Right. So the Zionist movement um, was a movement that wanted, you could say, two different things. It wanted um, uh, some Zionists focused on a Jewish state uh, in Palestine, um, a state that would obviously uh, focus on representing and privileging Jews over, over Palestinians. Other, other Zionists who, who uh, cultural Zionists focused on the importance of a Jewish society in Israel-Palestine. So if Theodor Herzl was the progenitor of political Zionism, a man who wrote under the name of Achad Ha'am was the progenitor of cultural Zionism. Uh, and, and what was important about this is that as you move through the 1930s into the 1940s, um, certain important cultural Zionists like Martin Buber, Hannah Arendt, Albert Einstein, um, uh, Judah Magnus said, we believe in the importance of a Jewish society in this area that, that, can, that has revived the Hebrew language, that, that it is important for the Jewish people around the world that there be a thriving Jewish community, a society, but we don't believe in a state that privileges Jews over Palestinians. Many of these people at various points wanted a binational state that provided equality for both Palestinians and Jews, that's a that's the tradition that I that 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 still that speaks compellingly to me. It's it's an it's not the tradition that won out. Of course, Israel did create a Jewish state in 1948 in an in in a war that led to the expulsion of. Uh, you know, three quarters of a million of, of Palestinians, um, and so there are many, many people who, seeing that a Jewish state uh, oppresses Palestinians, say, "Well, of course, I am say I'm an anti-Zionist," and I understand why the vast majority of Palestinians would take that view. But for me, the reason that I consider myself a cultural Zionist, as someone who believes in one equal state that provides equality under the law to everybody, irrespective of race, religion, and sex, but that I still call myself a cultural Zionist is it's a way for me of signaling that I believe very deeply in the importance of a thriving Jewish community, even a thriving Jewish society that keeps Hebrew alive, that allows certain things to happen culturally that can only happen in what Jews call the land of Israel, a place that is deeply precious to us religiously and culturally. But I don't see that in conflict with the idea of absolute equality for Palestinians. Thank you. Um, Sarah, did you wanna to add to that or, or I can move to my next question? Um, I mean, I would just say that the critiques I've seen of the legal analysis and the legal conclusions reached by the world's leading human rights organizations and, and human rights law clinic uh, at Harvard Law School have never engaged or debated the substance of the findings. Um, so for example, uh, 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 Folks uh, like uh, former ambassadors uh, to Israel, uh, commentators, uh, uh, longtime negotiators in the US peace process, uh, uh, like Aaron David Miller, their uh, uh, objection and the objection I've seen most uh, from knowledgeable, thoughtful people is that, well, this analysis isn't helpful. Uh, and it's the same uh, 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 response uh, of the United States, for example, um, when it says, well, this analysis isn't helpful. Um, Palestine joining the International Criminal Court uh, and the International uh, uh, Criminal Court's prosecutor opening uh, uh, an investigation into uh, war crimes uh, uh, by Israel, uh, as well as Palestinian armed groups in the occupied territory, is bad because it's not helpful. Um, there's never a substantive response to the actual uh, legal analysis. Um, and this is, you know, particularly troubling because it really serves to undermine 
uh, uh, international law, human rights law, international norms, because it demonstrates again and again from our government, um, from very esteemed commentators, critical thinkers, intellectuals, that they believe in those international laws and norms, except when it comes to Israel. When it comes to Israel, there should be a carve out from international law, there should be a carve out from human rights law, and somehow we need to exempt them uh, from uh, 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 the same standards that we want all the countries of the rest of the world to follow. That's actually a good segue into my next question. And again, I, I realize all of these topics warrant an entire week of, 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 of a conference, not even just a panel. Uh, but my, so my next question is now that, you know, we've discussed some of the, at least on, on you summarize the analysis and inclusions of international human rights organizations. It's notable that it starkly contrasts with the US position on Israel's human rights, which Sarah just alluded to. And when we compare the US position on, for example, Egypt and some other, um, Iraq, Iran, other countries in the region, in the Middle East, uh, you see congressional pressure to adhere to human rights laws, whether it's withholding military aid, whether it's outright sanctions, um, whether at the very least it's, it's political uh, vilification. However, you rarely if ever see a congressperson and, and certainly not a US president criticize Israel for its human rights violations. I mean, that is except for Representative Rashida Tlaib and Anne Omar, who were the first two Muslim women um, who are also immigrants or children of immigrants who have brought up the issue of Palestinian human rights. And then they're accused of being anti-Semitic. And then they face an onslaught of death threats. Um, so I, I want to start with Peter. What are what do you think are the two or three key factors that cause the U.S. government to be uncritical of Israel's treatment of Palestinians, uh, is, especially in the West Bank and Gaza, but but especially in contrast to the much more open, acceptable, and almost encouraged criticism and presumption, right, that Middle East regimes are authoritarian and they're human rights violators. It's just this complete opposite with regard to Israel as if no, 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 it can never do any wrong. And if there's a wrong, it's just a, an error or a mistake or an anomaly. Right. Although obviously when those Arab regimes are America's allies, um, uh, we uh, tend to be pretty sympathetic to them, even when they're profoundly oppressive as well, whether it's Saudi Arabia. I, I'm going to get to that. And I'm going okay, yes, to yes, no, I, 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 I knew you, you obviously know that. Um, I, I think in terms of why it's so difficult um, to to criticize Israeli human rights abuses in, in, in Washington, I think there, there are several factors. The first is there is a deep identification among many conservative white American Christians with Israel. Um, and I think it, uh, um, it partly comes from the fact that Israel, like the United States, is a settler colonial state. Um, now, I, I think Zionism was was a return of Jews to a place that has always that 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 is deeply deeply important to us. But it was also had very clear settler colonial features, and it says people were coming from another place with an with a desire to essentially create a state that would put them on top and put the people who were who had been the, the people who the people who had been native to that area um, when they arrived at the bottom. And I think there's a deep association, essentially, with the notion that Israel is a West. Western state, um, and um, it's in this sea of um, a kind of Muslim world that Americans have, have tend to see as very threatening and alien, and especially since September 11th. Um, and I think one of the reasons, frankly, that uh, one of the things that's been very difficult, you mentioned Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar, the, 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 the powerful Islamophobia that has made it very difficult for American Muslims to make their way in the political process, um, I, I think has made it harder for the demographic shifts in the United States with a larger American Arab and Muslim population because of changes in immigration policy post 1965 to have an impact on the debate over Israel-Palestine. Not of course that all Arabs and Muslims are monolithic in, in any way, but that in fact, there's so much pressure on anybody who is Muslim or who is Arab who wants to be involved in government because of the the, the kind of very the very racist discourse that we tended to have um, again, especially since September 11th. I think that's been another reason. Um, I also think that there is a strong, a historic, and and in some ways quite admirable 
um, sense of concern for the Jewish people, um, given uh, given the Holocaust, given uh, centuries of tremendous persecution, uh, often in Christian countries in particular, and a sense that people want them, Jews to be safe. And I, as a, as a, as a Jew myself, I find that uh, uh, admirable and moving. But I, I, the argument that I would make to people is, our safety does not require Jewish supremacy. In fact, I believe that ultimately equality under the law, whether it's in the United States or Israel, Palestine or anywhere else, is in the long term the best guarantee of Jewish safety because I don't believe that inflicting the violence of oppression on others in the long term makes you safe. And then the last point, the last, uh, I think, element is that the, the American Jewish community in the, starting in the 1970s, really reoriented its, its major organ institutions to focus on defense of the state of Israel. In the middle of the 20th century, the defining issue for American Jewish institutions was actually the civil rights movement, because American Jews believed that if African Americans won legal equality, it would help pave the way for Jews who still faced quotas at American universities at that point to gain equality ourselves. But once that happened for a variety of reasons, there was this turn towards the idea that the new vector of anti-Semitism was criticism and hostility to the state of Israel. And so the American Jewish community organized, unfortunately, quite effectively to take its political resources to focus on. And so that combined with Christian evangelicals combined with Islamophobia, I think creates a very potent political cocktail, which makes it very difficult for politicians to speak about Palestinian rights. Thank you. Sarah, you, you do a lot of work on democracy for the Arab world now. You do a lot of work on human rights in the region. You've worked for decades on human rights in the region uh, for Human Rights Watch as well. Can you can you provide us some of your analysis in terms of this, this stark contrast? Sometimes not so much. I think we've seen a lot more of these strange bedfellows of UAE, Saudi Arabia. You know, there's also some shifts, as we know, in the region in terms of competition for regional hegemony between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which arguably started since '79, but has really taken off in the last um, in the post 9/11 era. But could you explain to the audience kind of that 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 tripartite, right? U.S. v. Arab regimes, U.S. v. Israel, and then even U uh, Israel, and now some of the Arab regimes. I mean, Egypt, the country that, that I was born in, was the first, right, to make formal peace, which was certainly, you know, made Egyptians um, persona non grata. Palestinians were very upset, and, and I understand why. Um, but could you give us kind of your, your political analysis of the situation? Yeah, um, sure. I think you're asking a little more broadly than just the issue of um, uh, the U.S. government's uh, double, triple, quadruple standards on uh, human rights uh, criticism uh, and human rights uh, sanctions and, and policies that, that are uh, shaped in human rights to, to something more broad that has to do with U.S. policies vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's true that uh, regardless of the uh, long standing decades of American military and political support to abusive, uh, 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 dictatorial, autocratic governments uh, in um, the Middle East, uh, there has always been more space to criticize the records of Arab governments, um, whether uh, by the State Department in its uh, annual State Department reports, uh, whether by efforts of members of Congress to limit uh, U.S. military assistance uh, uh, because of gross human rights abuses. So, for example, uh, Egypt uh, right now and perennially uh, comes up for qualification of the over billion dollars of military assistance that our government provides it um, because of uh, its uh, horrific human rights record and some members of Congress feel compelled to try to slice off a, a small bit of that military assistance, uh, typically no more than 5%, to condition it on human rights reforms. And the State Department every single year fights tooth and nail uh, against conditioning one cent of military assistance to uh, Egypt. Um, so, uh, in fact, I think while the, the rhetoric of criticism uh, of uh, uh, abusive Arab governments uh, has been uh, stronger, um, the policy has been 
quite similar to Israel's in the US's pattern of providing military and political support uh, to abusive, authoritarian, autocratic, and apartheid governments uh, in the region uh, as a measure of control. To, to have an alliance with the dictators, the autocrats, uh, to secure uh, a US hegemony, US military control, US military bases in their countries. Uh, and of course, with the Gulf states, the, the very, very, very important feature of a secure flow of cheap oil. Um, I think 9-11, uh, which we just celebrated the 21st or recognized, commemorated, not celebrated, but commemorated the uh, anniversary of uh, a few days ago, shook up uh, America's relationship uh, with uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, more recently, uh, as we approached the fourth anniversary of the uh, uh, murder of Jamal Khashoggi, uh, a journalist, Saudi journalist who was based in the Washington DC, but lured into the Saudi consulate uh, in uh, Istanbul where uh, Mohammed bin Salman uh, or ordered uh, his butchering, uh, as well as Saudi Arabia's uh, war in Yemen, which has uh, for zero apparent gain or political uh, advance over the past seven years, uh, caused the death of over half a million Yemenis, again caused members of Congress to push back and, and demand that the United States uh, and uh, the White House, the State Department, uh, uh, limit their uh, uh, effectively unconditional uh, support of Saudi uh, uh, governments, Saudi regimes, uh, uh, and to stop selling them weapons. Um, that hasn't happened. Uh, it hasn't happened under the Trump administration. And frankly, uh, as we've now seen, it hasn't happened uh, under the Biden administration, which has uh, renewed uh, 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 very lucrative arms sales uh, to Saudi Arabia and the UAE, notwithstanding their devastating war in Yemen, uh, is fighting tooth and nail uh, uh, against congressional efforts to limit even 300 million of the uh, $1.3 billion that the United States is gifting the dictatorship of Egypt, uh, to say nothing of absolute silence, even within Congress, of the one and a half billion dollars that our government uh, gifts the, the Jordanian royal uh, dictatorship monarchy. <laughs> you know, these guys get to call themselves kings, but they're really just king dictators, uh, where the repression in the country has dramatically uh, escalated. I think what's new and different is that uh, for a while, uh, Israel would weaponize human rights reports criticizing, for example, Saudi Arabia. Uh, in fact, criticized Human Rights Watch uh, for having traveled to Saudi Arabia uh, and uh, met with civil society uh, representatives there at a very different time in the country when there was opening uh, to talk about human rights, uh, to, to seek support for organizations like Human Rights Watch. Uh, that was something that uh, you could attack uh, people for. You could use Saudi Arabia's record to attack Saudi Arabia and the Israeli government would prominently uh, 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 try to do that, as well as uh, uh, Israel lobby groups in the US would try to weaponize uh, 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 Saudi Arabia's record uh, against Saudi Arabia, because of course, Saudi Arabia and uh, most of, of the rest of the Arab states had no uh, uh, relationship and were deemed hostile to Israel uh, because of the issue of Palestine. I think the biggest transformation now uh, is uh, uh, the developments by virtue of the Abraham Accords, where Israel not only now seeks to uh, shield itself from criticism, uh, shield any change in the unconditional billions of military support that the US uh, provides uh, Israel, but is actively seeking to shield Egypt uh, for, uh, 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 and Saudi Arabia and the UAE, encouraging the US uh, to continue arms sales to those countries, encouraging the US uh, to uh, uh, temper criticism uh, of these governments because uh, they have established friendlier relations um, with Israel. So all of the considerations of human rights are get thrown out the window. And in fact, you will hear the Biden administration say that, well, we are tempering our criticism and we're tempering curtailing our close alliance with Saudi Arabia and UAE because they are on the road uh, to having good relations um, with uh, the apartheid state of Israel, as if somehow that's a good thing 
or that serves America's interests, or that serves the interests of the people who live under the controls of these um, brutal, brutal governments. So I think what has changed is this new uh, axis uh, alliance um, that basically, uh, in some ways, now increasingly features Israel, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt, as well as their little satellite Bahrain and Jordan and Morocco and even Sudan, to act as a block vis-a-vis -vis the United States, vis-a-vis -vis America's policies uh, in, in, in the Middle East. And that is a, a, a block that has yet to fully form or that has yet to fully exercise its leverage and voice uh, as a unitary bloc. But we have seen elements of that. Uh, and that is something I think we should all be watching very carefully. Well, so I'm two thoughts came to mind. Um, the first is that if anybody were to call you Islamophobic or anti-Arab for your critiques, many of us would never take that seriously, right? And so I think, and I'm saying that because um, you and others, myself included, anytime we do any kind of political analysis or human rights-based analysis criticizing Israel, there's always either explicitly or implicitly this allegation of anti-Semitism, which really quashes even just political analysis. So I think, again, just to bring it back to what we started is it's, we're at a university. <laughs> Our job is to encourage students to listen to different perspectives and to think through and look at the facts um, and not always agree. And I think it's just important that we do not allow um, the, the real problem of anti-Semitism and the real problem of Islamophobia to be weaponized to quash any kind of critical thinking or critical debate, especially when we're, we're talking about these really important issues. And then the other thing that comes to mind is it's, it's a very depressing state of affairs for human rights in general in the region and in other parts of the world, or whether you're dealing with the Uyghurs, whether you're dealing with Muslim minorities in, in India, whether you're dealing with the Rohingya. So I, I do think that you know, the students that are in the audience, you have a huge burden that you have to carry, and that is to protect human rights and, and make it keep, bring it back as an international norm across the world, not just in, in the US. And so I have a, one final question before we move to Q&A. And Peter, if you want to build on what Sarah just said, feel free to, because I'm going to come to you first. But I think it's really important to highlight this. And, and I do say this as someone who's a member of you know, the generation that I'm in, is that we're seeing a gradual, hard fought, <laughs> and it's slow, shift in domestic conversations, especially at the grassroots, about Palestinian human rights in the United States. And university students um, are, are just wanting to bring those conversations to campus, Progressive, some progressive media is starting to cover Palestinians' perspectives and, and at least let Americans know about all of these um, atrocities that have been happening for a long time. Um, and you have these four minority women progressive representatives in Han Omar, Rashida Tlaib, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and Ayanna Presley, who have also openly highlighted or at least brought to light uh, human rights issues um, and human rights violations of Palestinians. Um, and then we just saw the latest example of congressional action, which is the letter to the State Department regarding the Israeli government's criminalization of six Palestinian human rights organizations that were signed by 21 congressional um, officials or House you know, representatives, which is not that many, but it's compared to where we used to be. So something's happening, right? Something is happening at the grassroots. Um, Peter, what's your analysis? What's, why is it happening? Um, and what do you foresee in the future? And I'm particularly interested in your perspective on kind of the interfaith or cross-racial, cross-ethnic alliances of these younger generations? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a couple of reasons. I think, first of all, um, the, the, the fact that Israel has now had, since, 2000, since Netanyahu's election in 2009, governments that are very closely associated with, with the right, not only in Israel, but the right in the United States, and actually around the world. I mean, that Israel has become not just key to this new alliance in the Middle East of author, you know, of uh, which includes very deeply repressive governments, but actually Israel has become a kind of a model for um, uh, an economically fairly dynamic ethnocracy, right? Um, that, that might have some formal democratic institutions, but is essentially built around the privileging of one 
ethnic or religious or racial group over another. And that model has been very appealing for various different movements and leaders around the world, whether you're Viktor Orban in Hungary or Narendra Modi in India. Um, and so, um, or in, so in many ways, the, the white nationalist right in the United States you know, if you look at the right, you look at someone like Ann Coulter, for instance, and Coulter will often say, well, we want Israel's immigration policy because we also want an immigration policy that maintains our demographic majority, right? That these, the, the, what the right in the United States wants in some ways is a country that maybe might have some formal democratic institutions a little bit, but essentially is going to make sure that power and high resides with white Christian people, right? One white Christian man in particular. And this is the, uh, and so I think that in, in that way, I think seeing all of that, it's not surprising that younger people who are, uh, uh, who are fighting for equality under the law in the United States, right? For the very reasons that some people on the far, on the right of the United States might see Israel as a model, they see Israel as a warning. Right. And so um, they see the struggle for equality in the United States, the struggle against people like Donald Trump, as, as interconnected with the struggle against people like Benjamin Netanyahu. I think that's one reason we've seen the shift. The second thing is that I think the movement for Black Lives Matter and Me Too, the Me Too movement, created a new awareness or at least a new sense of embarrassment about, about questions of representation in the American media and other institutions. And I think what we saw with the fighting um, in Gaza and Jerusalem and other places last year was that that trickle down maybe more than it had before to the question of Israel-Palestine. And people said, wait a second, is it really, maybe it is a problem that so many of our conversations about Palestinians don't include Palestinians. And while there's a long way to go, I think there has been significant progress in the American media on that question. When you bring Palestinians into the conversation, it really does change everything. Um, what we don't have is a strong transmission mechanism from the, to those cultural changes and media changes to into government. In fact, what we've seen is extreme, and one of the reasons for that is the American political system is really not all that democratic, right? Um, and so just as public opinion on gun control or abortion or, or climate change doesn't translate, it's not that hard to actually maintain a policy for quite a long time, right? The polling shows that not so much among Republicans, but at least 50% of Democrats right now, according to polling, if you look at Shibli Telekami's polling, basically want the US to at least condition, if not wholly withhold military aid to Israel, right? And yet, as you said, the number of Democrats in Congress who take that view, you could count them on maybe on two hands. And, and part of that is we don't have a good transmission mechanism. And, and, and partly that's because of, um, you know, and one of the things that, that groups like APAC have done is they have taken advantage of the undemocratic aspects of our political system, the Supreme Court decision that allowed the spending of unlimited money through super PACs to create these super PACs that have spent extraordinary amounts of money, right? Five millionaires, five millionaires have each given a million dollars or more to APAC super PAC, right? They've, and they've used this to take mean that any politician who's looking out for their political future is going to say, I'm risking political suicide by taking a pro-Palestinian position. And the, what's particularly difficult is it's not a voting issue for most people, right? I mean, most people, we have so many problems in the United States, right? That, that even though most, people, most Democrats have a fairly progressive perspective on Israel, it's not their number one, two, three issue to vote on because they're worried about the fact that they don't have water in Mississippi, they don't have a vote, abortion rights, environmental catastrophe. So it's then fairly easy when you can put that all that that on the, that all that money on the scale, on the ledger to basically a politician don't face much of a backlash for taking positions D Democrats for taking positions that their supporters disagree with I think that um, I also think that the fact that you have a collaborationist Palestinian leadership in the West Bank which is authoritarian, which is corrupt, which has no moral authority, and which is actually working with Israel to prevent the kind of nonviolent, morally based resistance that you that I would that I would like to see keeps this issue off of the American front pages. When the issue is when it, when it is on the front pages and on MSNBC and CNN, you see that Americans respond. But you know, if you look at what happened in South Africa in the 1980s, the ANC and their local affiliates on the ground had a concerted strategy 
to make create resistance that would amplify the anti-apartheid movement around the world. And what you have now is you don't have a Palestinian leadership on the ground, right? Not putting aside Hamas, which does do a kind of resistance, but has no moral authority whatsoever, right? It's shooting rockets that kill civilians. It doesn't speak in the language of human rights and international law. And so you don't have the Palestinian leadership that I think could help to strengthen movements for Palestinian freedom in the United States. And so those are some of the problems I think we have in taking this latent shift that we see culturally in public opinion and media and actually making it a shift that can change US policy. I, I want to, I mean, I appreciate your analysis. I want to push back on one thing. And I think of it also in the context of minorities in the US. I just wonder how much of the, the, the factors that produce this dysfunctional and corrupt mm. Palestinian leadership mm. uh, in the West Bank, how much of it is also by design? I mean, you hear this criticism a lot from Palestinians and others who, who want to see Palestinians have their own state, is that it's very difficult for a functional, effective, uh, representative group to rise up because it's, uh, they're not operating in a vacuum. Um, and so there, uh, there's obviously this chicken or the egg problem, but at the same time, when you are the oppressed people, uh, you don't have, a, by design, you don't really have a lot of power and there's the, those who are in power and doing the oppressing, they're definitely intervening, even if it's behind the scenes. There's no question. The costs of, of resistance are enormous, right? I mean, South Africa did not only have Nelson Mandela and the ANC, it also had Gacha Butelezi and Inkata who were running the KwaZulu uh, Natal, the KwaZulu homeland, and were in collaboration with the South African government. That was an alternative, right? Uh, and it took enormous political organization and strength to take the harder route, which was the root resistance. There's no, that, right, there's no question that Israel would prefer to have a collaborationist leadership on the, when the West Bank, he doesn't want Palestinian elections. It wants to Palestinian leadership that can, and doesn't care that, that it's corrupt and it's authoritarian. In fact, that's that's more more a feature than a bug, right? From Israel's perspective, right? So um, I'm not I'm not saying this to relieve those of us who have the enormous privilege of being in the United States of our responsibility to try to change things. Not no not not at all. We have that responsibility no no matter what. But I do think the facts. Uh, I, I think that 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 we people in the United States will inevitably respond to the voices they hear from Palestinians. And unfortunately, the voices that sometimes have the biggest megaphones because they lead the Palestinian Authority are people like Mahmoud Abbas, who can't be that moral voice. All right, Sarah, did you want to add before we move to Q&A? Well, I think I think uh, Peter covered it pretty well. Okay, wonderful. We have a few. We have a few minutes left um, for questions, and answers, and I can't um, cover everyone. I'll answer all the questions, but I will certainly try. I'm so flattered to have both of you here. This was such an enriching conversation. Um, I hope that everybody who hears it will go and read your work uh, and follow uh, your your various publications because there's not enough time to discuss everything that we wanted. Um, and I just want to reiterate that you know, we are one of the few centers in America, the Center for Security, Race, and Rights, that will tackle these difficult issues, one of which is talking about Palestinian human rights. Um, and we're also going to be talking about settler colonialism with Professor uh, Natsu Saito Taylor. And we're also going to be talking about Islamophobia with, with Dr. Maha Hilal. Those are the two other lectures we have this fall. And then next spring, we have Professor Aziz Rana, who's going to discuss his book, The Two Faces of American Freedom. And we're going to have Professor Bisharat, uh, George Bisharat, who's going to talk about the social justice movement and, and international legal rights movement for Palestinian human rights. Um, and we will also have Professor Heba Gawayed, who will talk about her excellent book, Refuge, How States Shape Human Potential. Um, so we, we get a lot of support, but we also get a lot of criticism, uh, which is we welcome. This is a university. This is an academic setting. This is the space of all spaces in America, the university, where we have got to have these difficult conversations. We have to learn how to agree to disagree, and we have to do the research and sometime and not take it personally. Um, and so for that reason, I'm so honored really to have Peter Beinart and Sarah Lee Whitson. Their jobs are not easy. They are truth speakers very difficult to be a truth speaker these days. 
Um, and I'm excited for the future. I think you know, the future is bright if, if these are going to be our, our, our intellectual thought leaders. So I am very excited. And so with that, thank you so much, Peter. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you everyone for attending. Thank you.